Hey, Freedom family and friends, this is Pastor Larry. It is Tuesday, April the 6th. I hope that you're doing well, and I trust that you've had an awesome day celebrating the resurrection and Easter, right? And yes, it's a day, but for us as Christians, we know it's our life, and we're just so thankful. We really are, and we're so grateful for all that God is doing, and I'm glad that you're here. And uh, so grab your Bibles. We're going to be in Romans and Romans chapter 10, and we're almost through with Romans chapter 10. We're going to at least get uh, towards the end of it, and and then at the end of the week, we'll finish that up, and then next week we'll be in chapter 11. But I'm glad that you're here today, and so I'm so thankful that you're a part of this. Don't forget to hit that like button. Yep, go ahead and hit that, smash that button, and you still have time to share. And uh, many of you already done that. I've seen it on your post already. You've shared, you've invited someone else, and you can comment as well. I would love to hear your prayer request, and uh, would love to hear anything that maybe is on your heart. Uh, maybe it's an upcoming surgery. Maybe it's for someone else, and uh, that's okay. Uh, you don't even have to mention that person's name. Uh, you could just say, pray for a friend of mine or whatever, and we'll do that. I go through every one of those, and I know that prayer makes a huge difference. I'm so glad that you're a part of today's study. Today's going to be really, really good as we dive in to a couple of specific verses, and uh, those verses of chapter 10, verses 12 and 13. And I uh, think these verses are so timely for the moment, as well as because we just came off of uh, Resurrection Sunday. And I trust and hope that you were able to be on campus and that you were able to participate. Maybe if you weren't feeling that you could be on campus face-to-face, -face, um, that you joined online. And uh, if it would be a help to you, uh, just what I showed and shared with you at the beginning of this Bible study was just a short snippet of some of the music and part of our service that was this past Sunday. I would encourage you to go to our YouTube channel, uh, which is Freedom Church for Others, Freedom Church, the number four, others. And uh, you can watch our most recent service, Resurrection Sunday, Easter, as well as, you know, you can catch that even here on Facebook. But I hope you don't leave right now to go do that. I hope you'll stay with me and uh, let's dig in. And I hope that you got your coffee. You got a cup of coffee, some tea, some water, whatever the case may be. Just sit back, relax. Let's get into the study together today. And uh, as we just join each other and in God's word. And I'm so, again, thankful that you could be a part of today's um, Facebook Live Bible study. And, you know, don't think that your participation and your comments don't matter. They do. And they also encourage others that kind of plug in. And, you know, there are a lot of people who watch that never comment and that never say anything. And, you know, it might just encourage them and to just engage as well. And uh, that does make a difference because it feels more of a community when you engage. So Romans chapter 10, I hope you're there with me. And let's look at some verses. Let's look at verses 12 and 13 of Romans 10. Are you there? Good. Paul says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Then verse 13, we all know it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, we started this last time with the thought of, really, this is two things happening here. There are two thoughts, and there is a to what I want to say, a two-way connection. What is that? There is connection between sin and justification. When Paul says there is no difference between Jew and Gentile, what is he saying? Well, we know what he's saying is in regards to previous verses that he's written in Romans, where Paul says in Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned. Where does that leave us? It leaves us that regardless of our background, regardless of our upbringing, regardless of any religious um, connection that we have or that we're familiar with, 
we are all at this point. We are all guilty. We are sinners. And Paul is letting them know, the Jews and the Gentiles that were present, as well as us today, we are all at the same level ground. We are on the same level ground. And that is we're sinners, right? But then he says there's the other connection, and that is justification. So while we are all sinners, regardless of a Jew or a Gentile, we are guilty before God. We come short of the glory of God. All of us can receive and obtain justification. That means to be made righteous in God through Jesus Christ, because Paul said in verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, I love this because verses 12 and 13 are really introducing that great declaration that whosoever, verse 13 says, whosoever, that means anyone, that means Everyone shall be saved. And this is a quotation, again, Paul's quoting from an Old Testament, a writer, and he's quoting from Joel 2.32. Did you know that? Joel 2.32 says that, and here's the thing, this phrase is found twice in the New Testament. It's found in Acts 2.21 and also in Romans 10, verse 13. And I think a comparison of this is really revealing because it's quoted once by Peter and then once by the Apostle Paul. And once we see it at the beginning of Acts, and we also see it at the end of Acts. And when Peter mentions this phrase, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, Israel was still being pleaded to they the the peter the the disciples were still pleading the prophets were still pleading if you will during their early acts time period right for the nation of israel and once while god was still pleading um with israel to accept her king right here is your king we know that they rejected their king no we don't want jesus as our messiah crucify him. We know the story. They were in really blindness. They were in spiritual blindness. That's why Paul said there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. They had, Israel had rebelled against God. So had we. We are the same in that aspect. And so God was dealing with his covenant people. And once after God had begun to break down the middle wall partition, right? There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. What was happening when Christ died on the cross? We know through the story and the historical um, accuracy of the Bible, the Bible lets us know that the veil, right? There was a veil in the temple that separated um, the priest and the people from the Holy of Holies, right? And the Bible says that that veil was torn from top to bottom. That's also symbolic of that the veil and the partition that had separated different nations has now been done away with. And this was broken down between Gentile and Jew. And Paul comes on the scene. He's the writer of this. And he says that he is the God's appointed apostle for us Gentiles. We know that. And he had been sent to declare that before God, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. So we've got to consider these statements. The statement, there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, and the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. We've got to consider this because Paul wrote this, right, some years later. And it's observed, first of all, when Peter makes this quotation, that he's really going along with the context in Acts 2. Remember, Peter says this statement, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Um, He makes this statement in Acts chapter 2. And I know you're in Romans, 
But I want you to find Acts chapter 2, and let's look at verses 19, 20, and 21. So we're in a Bible study together. Why don't you take a moment, keep a bookmark in Romans 10, because we got to come back to it, and look at Acts chapter 2, and look what Peter says. I'm going to give you a minute to find it. This is in Acts chapter 2, verses 19, 20, and 21. The passage that is referred from Joel, Joel 2.32, is about Pentecost and the tribulation. Well, that would match what Peter would say, because Peter was a disciple. Peter was sent unto the nation of Israel, while Paul was sent unto the nation of Gentiles. And so Peter is writing and preaching, and he is writing this concerning Pentecost, And here is this passage in Acts chapter 2, verses 19, 20, and 21. I hope you've had it time to find it. And if you don't, just listen to these verses. Maybe you're on a tight schedule and at work. But I'm going to ask you some questions right after I read these verses. So try to pay attention on purpose, okay? Here we go. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, And I will show wonders in heavens above. And signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, and a vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, if you listen to those verses or you read along with me, let me ask you three questions and think about this because it's a yes or no, but be very thoughtful in your answers because here we go. In reading Acts chapter 2, based on Joel, in uh, Joel 2, 32, has this time, has this as yet, come to best pass has this time that Peter and Joel are speaking of has it come to pass yet do we see those signs today and third is the day of the Lord now being ushered in now if you know the context of your Bible and you're keeping things in the right dispensation If you're a careful, thoughtful Bible student, the answer to those questions are no. Now, a lot of people are getting caught up in the blood moons and those kind of things. And that's good, but that is not what's happening today or a reference. This is futuristic. This is prophetic, which means these are things to come. The answer to these questions Has it come to pass? Do we see these signs today? And is the day of the Lord being ushered in? The answer to that is an astounding no. It is in connection, though, with those terrors and what will usher in the day of the Lord because Peter said, And it shall come to pass in Acts chapter 2, which we just read, verse 21, the very beginning of verse 21, gave it away. And it shall come to pass that whosoever call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, this is a prophetic moment, and it has not yet been fulfilled. These are not the times of the signs, and surely this is not the day of the Lord. What we are living in is the day of man. This is why war and bloodshed go on practically every day without interruption, not even interruption of our government officials, right? And they even meet, really, if we're honest, in vain to discuss plans for peace and safety. Folks, there will be no peace and safety until ultimately Jesus returns physically and sets up his kingdom 
on this earth. But here's the thing. God had a secret, and he had a secret purpose in Peter that Peter didn't even know. And these signs and tribulation of the tribulation were not immediately to follow those of Pentecost. Peter is preaching on Pentecost. Indeed, I know the signs of Pentecost, they're going to vanish away, and they have. But God is then going to offer up to his enemies reconciliation by grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is why Paul can say there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for Christ is rich unto all that call upon him. So Christ on the cross, this is why the resurrection and the Calvary is so important. Christ had slain the enmity, right, between God and man, and he's made it possible for you and I to be just, to be justified, and that Christ is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That's Romans 3.26. So in Romans 3.23, he says, for all have sinned, right? But then in Romans 3.26, he says, but you can be justified by the justifier of him, Christ, unto all that call upon him. So this is very, very important. Now, here is why Paul quotes Joel 2.32 in Romans 10.12. It's really noticed that Paul quotes from Joel, and when he says there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Gentile, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. Now, verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let me ask you a question that I asked you a minute ago. Based on Peter's preaching in Acts 2, has that come to pass? No. But according to what Paul just said, has that come to pass? The answer is yes. So one is no, the other is yes. Because we as believers in Christ, man, we cry hallelujah to this yes, because we are some of the whosoever. If you are saved today, my friend, you are part of the whosoever. Those in Peter's day, that part of nation of Israel had rejected the Messiah. And there's going to come a time where that's going to be reconciled. God's going to make that right. Now, as significant as what Peter said, and he quotes this directly in prophetic context, really incredible. You ought to read about Peter and study that out. But it's even more significant that Paul quotes this in this new setting because the signs which began at Pentecost, early Acts time period, are vanished away here in Romans. And the horrors predicted have not even yet come to pass. So what happened? This is why we studied this out. And while I want to make sure I don't lose you, this is why it's so important of what I just said. What Peter said and what Paul said seems to be very different, and they are. Yet Paul brings this into perspective in Romans chapter 10 because what Peter says hasn't happened, yet what Paul says has happened. Why is this so significant and why is this important? Here's the reason why. God is not saying whosoever calls in the sense predicted by Joel and proclaimed by Peter, and stay with me, the wonderful fact is that God has now sent out a whosoever. See, God has sent this out. God wasn't saving back then whosoever, but he is now. See, in order to have been saved under Israel's program, you had to be proselytized into that. You had to go through the nation of Israel. Now we go through Jesus Christ. 
And so that's why Paul brings this up. And the wonderful fact is, is that the whosoever now is offering eternal salvation without interruption. And so this eternal salvation is to whosoever, to everyone. And what did God do? God put the prophetic program that was under the old covenant, under disciples, under Peter. He put a time out. He interrupted that program. He put it on pause, if you will. Why? Because wrath was to come. As soon as Jesus showed up, wrath was to come. Man, I mean, it was going to be terrible. All those who rejected God, who had waged war with God, have now got an answer to God. But God saw fit to put that on Paul's. And he interrupted that by ushering in, according to Paul, this present dispensation of grace. That is why verses 12 and 13 are just bigger than just reading through them and missing out on the real depth of these passages. Because, folks, it's really explaining what was to come, what was put on Paul's, and what we are experiencing right now. I thank God for grace. This is a greater appreciation for grace that you and I should have. And I just think, you know, we ask ourselves how blessed we are. We are so blessed because of this grace. I mean, how much more now, both Jew and Gentile, right? All of us. Peter has never dreamed, could have never dreamed this on the day of Pentecost. Why? It's not the message that God gave to Peter. It's the message that God gave to Paul. And so think about this. In this present evil age in which we live in right now, today, God is offering grace, not punishment, not condemnation, not wrath. He's offering his wonderful, beautiful grace as a free gift unto all that call upon him. Yes, the vilest sinner. The Bible says that we can be justified by grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's Romans 3, 26. That is the word of God. Paul is letting us know and teaching us so clearly. What a special time we live in. And all of this grace is apart from religious works. And to think that believers, that you and I get to be ambassadors for Christ. What a great message you and I have to give to all that are living in this age. God is withholding his wrath. There is still time. There's an opportunity for you to come out from that wrath, to be forgiven of your sin, and be justified, to be declared righteous. Because the Bible is clear, for there is none righteous, no, not one. For we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But but we can be justified And he, Christ, is the justifier of him, right? That call upon Christ. So Christ is the one who justifies it all. This is why the cross of Christ is so very important. And we are ambassadors. We are, we get to represent Christ. And what an honor this is, right? What a special honor and privilege you and I have as believers. And I hope that you are. And if you don't know Christ today as your Lord and Savior, my friend, you are under his wrath. You are waiting for the day of wrath. My friend, you don't have to live under that. You can be free from that. You can come out from that bondage. And you can be set free by the truth of God's word. Because the Bible says, and Jesus declared in his own words, I, he says, for I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh 
unto the Father, but by me. My friend, whatever you've been told, there's only one way to eternal life in heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. For the Bible says in John, the Gospel of John, John chapter 8, whom the Son, capital S-O-N, whom the Son sets free, shall be free indeed. What an incredible thought. There's no religious efforts or works that we have to do. There's no laws that we have to perfect. There's no proselytizing, circumcision, dietary laws, and on and on. I mean, it was numerous laws. There's no coming under another nation in order to get to God. God did away with that. He tore the veil. He made a way for you and I and for the world to obtain forgiveness. No more sacrificing by the high priest. No more having to slaughter animals and offer fruits and offer things that were good and of the first fruits unto God. No, all that's been done away with. We don't go to a person anymore. We have what's called an high priest, right? His name is Christ. We go to one and that one is Jesus Christ. And I thank God that what a great opportunity that you and I have to deliver this message to the lost. So my friend, you think about verses 12 and 13 of Romans 10. For there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's there's no difference. No, the same Lord is rich unto all, right? And so it's not based on your efforts or your merits. It's based on your heart to be willing to accept his love. This is not a question of whether God loves you. This is not a question of whether his love is enough. My friend, God's love is enough. It's more than enough. It's not a question of whether God loves you. The question is, are you willing and will you be open to receive the love that God has for you? Say, what love is that? The love that where the Bible says, Greater hath no love for any man than for a man to lay down his life for another. That's the greatest love of all, isn't it? I'm willing to sacrifice. I'm willing to suffer. I'm willing to give my all. That's exactly what God did through Christ for you and for me. I mean, you know Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth. The word commendeth means to show, but God showed and displayed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, we could go on and on about God's love. John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What am I saying? It is very clear and evident of God's love for us. But what must you and I do? What must the world do? We've got to be willing to receive and accept thy love. I receive God's love today. And if you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, my friend, his love is available to you. His forgiveness is available. You must be willing to turn in faith, right? You must be willing to acknowledge, repent, You must be willing to acknowledge and admit that you are a sinner and that you need God and that you receive his love. And you can do that right where you are. And as ambassadors, as a Christian, if you are a Christian, you and I have the privilege of taking this gospel message, the good news, right? That's what gospel means. The good news to the world that is hurting and that is lost. Well, that's going to be it today. And next time on Thursday, we're going to look at verses 14 through 21. And verses 14 through 21 really end up chapter 10. But there's a lot to discover. And we're just going to see how patient God is. So sometimes Israel and the nation of Israel can kind of seem like they get the short straw. And I want you to know that's not God's heart. It's not God's heart towards you. 
And God's very patient. And we're going to see that displayed in these last few verses. And we're going to dissect that. Let that be an encouragement to you. Now, God is patient. But may I remind you that he's patient for a while. Because even this grace period in which we live will run out. This time period will come to a close. And at the moment that Jesus returns, it will be then that the previous program will pick back up. And so I want to encourage you today. Don't waste a moment. If you're saved, don't waste a moment to encourage people to share the love of Christ with others. And if you aren't saved today, don't waste a moment. Don't waste another moment or day to give your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Remember, you are loved, you are prayed for, and I hope that you'll join me on Thursday as we continue to study through the book of Romans. Invite someone with you. I look forward to having you there with me then. Until then, God bless you. We love you.